So um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is around some of the contemporary challenges in research methods, in particular with a view on social sciences. So much has changed in the social science research landscape since I started out as a researcher. And some of the things that I'm going to cover today are around use of social media, um, the question of representation, um, quantitative versus qualitative versus mixed methods approach, and um, some issues around digitization and big data. And then because big data is particularly one of those issues that people ask a lot of questions about, I'm then going to pass over to Douglas, who's going to do um, a bit more of a, an in-depth look at some of the issues to do with big data. Social media is a particularly appealing tool for social scientists to consider. And this is something that often comes up, and I find uh, a lot of students who are doing um, undergraduate dissertations and master's dissertations are also interested in using social media um, as a research tool for, for quite a number of different reasons. Social media is appealing because it gives easy accessibility, or so it would seem, to vast quantities of what are user-generated data on a variety of topics. So from the researcher's point of view, the data are more accessible and appear to be more rich. But it is really worth um, looking at the use of social media and um, understanding some of the ethical concerns that exist around using um, social media as a research tool. I'm going to give you just some, uh, some limited examples here, which I hope would be useful to anybody, um, and particularly early career researchers who might be considering using social media as, as their tool of choice. Um, it's worth considering that informed consent does not really exist um, around the use of social media. So, for example, um, most of the platforms that people use on social media, the main ones obviously being Twitter, Facebook, um, etc., um, that there are terms and conditions um, that users of the platform sign up to. And this is often conflated with informed consent, but this is very problematic because most often the users have not read the terms and conditions properly and I think that's something that probably uh, all users of, of downloaded apps and software are, are guilty of. Um, and important aspects that, that we consider as social science researchers um, as being crucial to the integrity of our research are not explained or they're not adequately dealt with, such as the right to withdraw from the, the study and the, the right to withdraw data. There are also problems with anonymity as well. So, for example, um, uh, if you want to use data extracts from um, social media forums, uh, social media platforms, for example, the platforms themselves sometimes insist in their terms and conditions that any ex extracts have to be reproduced accurately and they have to be attributed to the original poster. So anonymity becomes a, a really difficult issue um, in uh, areas of anonymizing tweets, for example, or anonymizing posts. There's also a blurring of the boundary between the participant and the researcher if the researcher signs up um, for private forums and becomes a member of private forums, because in some ways then the research is happening at a covert level and uh, lots of issues, ethical issues around that. And then the, the last point that I really want to make on the use of social media that presents a challenge is that there's an increased risk um, or potential risk of harm to participants, particularly um, around sensitive topics that so people sign up for forums or um, uh, uh, social media pages that are on uh, quite often topics related to health issues, for example, or disability, um, for just to, to pick a couple of examples. And um, therefore, it's, it's easy for them to hide certain characteristics that they might have that might actually make them what we would consider in social science research to be a more vulnerable participant. In addition, it's very easy to hide age on social media. So whilst social media is this very appealing tool to social scientists because it, pre it presents this really great opportunity, the questions are very much about how we use it ethically um, and uh, how our data are robust 
and uh, we give participants the right to withdraw and we ensure informed consent. So those are some of the issues that I wanted to consider about social media. So um, the other thing that I think we have to be really aware of is that research has been guilty of ignoring certain population groups for some time, often with some alarming impact. And I, I really think um, that the, the best example that anybody can go and read uh, about this particular issue is the book by Caroline Criado Perez, um, Invisible Women Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. And Caroline Criado Perez gives um, some examples of things like crash test dummies, um, the research having been based on the male anatomy. And the, the result of this is that women um, have been more, more seriously injured in car accidents and more likely to die in car accidents because of uh, the research being only based on one half of the population. Women's heart attack symptoms have also been often ignored because the research focused on symptoms in men, which are different from those in women, and the medical textbooks were written around those. Criada Perez makes the point that we live in a world that's built around male data, which disadvantages over 50% of the population. And this is probably worse if we look at it in terms of intersectionality between um, gender, race, sexuality, ethnicity, and disability. There are some key groups that have been underrepresented in a lot of research that's been carried out. So the challenges here are quite clear. How do we ensure that our research builds in representativeness, if that's what we should be doing, and we don't neglect key societal groups? And what do we do if we spot underrepresentation in our data set? And how do we design our research to be more inclusive? Particularly in social science research, there's, there's an issue around generalizability of data to a wider population. And I think one of the questions that I want to raise here is what are we saying about that wider population if we're not building in representativeness into our research design um, and into the, the social science research that we're doing? So some key questions there. Obviously, if your research is focusing on one group, then it's not going to be more generalizable to the wider population anyway. But the, the questions that we need to be asking are about, you know, how do we ensure that actually all of the, the uh, social science research that we're carrying out, we can ensure it covers the wider population and that we're not neglecting key groups um, that are very important in this. Quantitative versus qualitative versus mixed methods, I think, has been a, a discussion in the social science research arena, certainly for as long as I can remember. And it was a key. Um, I remember having key discussions about this when I was doing my PhD. I think one of the challenges for social scientists is always about how to choose a distinct approach based on a, an, a, an epistemological perspective um, or whether to be much more pragmatic than combine methods. And I think there's um, uh, a lot of interdisciplinary research focus now, which is driving much more creative research methods where mixed methods can be a particular advantage. And um, here, what I just wanted to raise was um, a, a consideration around some of the global challenges um, that are key research areas for us at the moment. So we can um, use an example for for um, to consider such as how to create sustainable cities for the future and uh, if we were going to look at a, a research project around this particular area we could say that quantitative methods could provide a wider and more generalizable picture and could include mathematical and engineering and scientific disciplines qualitative methods can focus on people's lived experiences. So what is it, what would it be actually like to live in a sustainable city for the future? What are people's experiences of living in cities today? And qualitative methods can get to a really nice depth of people's opinion. If you bring those two methods together, you can help to challenge, uh, help to address some of the challenges that we're seeing in building new and healthier urban environments. And, and cut across disciplines to really take research into, into addressing some of the challenges that we have um, in the 21st century um, and really give a key role for social scientists in those areas. So very exciting opportunities um, as well as challenges for social scientists 
today. So I'm just going to finish on big data and, and hand over to Douglas, who's going to deal with this in a, a lot more detail. It, I think it's worth being aware that we collect more data today on more things than we ever have done before. But it's also worth being aware, aware that not all of the data are useful and they're certainly not meaningful if we're looking at extrapolating to other um, uh, contexts. There are unprecedented opportunities to study human behavior, uh, which are very appealing, as I've already mentioned, through, for example, data collected from social media, such as Facebook likes or Twitter retweets, that kind of thing. Um, the challenges around big data are around filtering the data to ensure that we get what we need and therefore how we define the filters that we use appropriately. It's very important for early career researchers uh, when they see this appealing mass of data to actually uh, recognize that the data are often not in a format that are ready for analysis and we're often retrofitting to the data set which raises the argument of whether we're being data driven or whether we're being theory driven. Most times the key challenge is around the fact that big data are second-hand data and therefore may not be the most suitable data for our research although they may, may be the most accessible and the most easily obtainable and therefore the most appealing. It's worth bearing in mind that uh, social science research, in my view, is something that's very exciting to engage with and uh, sometimes is going to involve a lot more hard work than actually just accessing data sets that, that already exist on social media. There are both challenges and opportunities in the way in which we do use those data, but also there may be more opportunities if we're actually going to design our own research tools and not therefore deal with secondhand data, which doesn't quite fit to our research question. Um, I hope that that's given you an interesting overview of some of the challenges and opportunities in social science research. And now for more detail and a, 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 more, a, a slightly different perspective, I'm going to hand over to Douglas. Okay, thank you, Jonathan and Fiona. So I just like to um, pick up on one of the comments that Fiona made, where she said we live in a world where there's more data than ever. So at the moment, it's something like 500 million tweets are sent each day, and uh, 300 billion emails are sent every day. So uh, some of us may feel we get a significant share of those, but I think that illustrates that we live in a world where data is growing at a very substantial rate. Um, it's estimated that we are currently generating uh, many exabytes of data each day, and an exabyte is a million terabytes or a million million megabytes. So clearly, we are going to have to learn how to work with such large amounts of numerical data. Uh, and uh, have data sets that are valuable in terms of enabling us to do research. So what I'd like to do is just to talk through some of the issues that arise from handling such very substantial amounts of data. Um, it's estimated that something like 90% of all the information on the planet is now available in a digital form. So clearly we need to continue to develop and enhance the way we engage with that. So the important issues are really thinking about how you safely and securely preserve the integrity of your data sets. Nowadays, it's very easy to edit or to modify your data sets. So you need to keep um, a track of the processes that interact with your data. Uh, we are also required um, in, by many legal frameworks to think about data security, to think about a data management policy, who has access to the data, um, and how is that access managed and or controlled. Um, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, is very well known. It's an EU law uh, and applies in many jurisdictions. Um, so then we think about how can you share and manage access to data in a way that uh, maximizes the value of the data, but also protects the integrity of the data. So UKRI, UK Research and Innovation, they support the Concordat on Open Research Data, 
which effectively talks about making data openly available for use by others in a way that's consistent with legal and ethical requirements, but also when thinking about the cost and the viability of making it accessible. Uh, there are equivalent codes of practice in Australia. The Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research talks about that. Um, and I think you need to think about how you manage access from your data really at the beginning. You know, if you're conducting a research project where you rely on this data, it really is the most valuable asset and commodity you have. So it's really important how you protect its integrity, its security, and how you control access to it. So the challenge with very large data sets is how can you make them useful? How can you engage with them? How can you draw value out of them? Um, and visualization is a technique that's very commonly used. So when you interpret a, a data set visually, um, it's more uh, easy to spot issues or problems with the data. Um, and so you need to think about maybe ways in which you can illustrate what your data is uh, suggesting uh, through visualization. You need to keep accurate records of data processing, how it's been manipulated, thinking about things like algorithms, process flows, data quality checks, uh, and version control. Uh, online platforms uh, generally allow you to, to do that when it's necessary. Um, metadata is a really important part of your data set. So imagine, for example, you open a large spreadsheet or database and you see millions of numbers in there, but there is no indication of what those numbers are, what the uh, units they're in, what parameters there are. So that, I think, illustrates the real importance of protecting and keeping metadata alongside your original data. Um, it enables you to compare data sets, it allows you to um, interrogate data sets, and it allows researchers in the future to continue to access data. Uh, so that requires you to think long term about your data structures, your file storage mechanisms, um, and you need to have a system that can really accommodate from the outset um, the data that you are likely to have by the end of the project. So I think it's really important that you plan big from the start and you have capacity in your system so you don't end up making incremental changes. So data sets of the size uh, and scope that we, we're talking about really require some sort of automated processing in terms of analysis, in terms of checking, in terms of uh, reviewing the consistency. So it's really important that you develop test, check, check, and test again the algorithms that you are using on your data. You need to be as confident as you possibly can be of what your data analysis is doing and, and how the processing is interacting with and or altering your data. Uh, so if something goes wrong, you need to be able to go back to the original data set and start again. It's really important that you think carefully about what analysis software is most appropriate. There are many types of software packages uh, available nowadays. Um, Well-known ones might be SPSS, NVivo, um, R. There are uh, many other software packages out there that can analyze data. If your data is your most valuable asset, then it's really important you think about how you can analyze the data using the best tools available. So don't just pick um, a software that you know and that you can use. Uh, think about how you can um, develop and enhance your skills further with new software and new tools. It's also important that you think about computing time and access, uh, because if you need access to high performance computing for analysis, that can often be um, very expensive and restricted. So do plan and make sure that you're able to do the type of analysis that you want to do, um, so that you are able to uh, anal analyze the data um, according to your original research um, plan. 
There are data access and sharing formats that you can develop, which enables those processes to happen more efficiently. So for example, the UK data service has uh, guidance and protocols and the Australian National Data Service also has uh, guidance and protocols, and you can find those organisations um, online. Research governance is a really important part of big data, and you know, particularly from the perspective of early career researchers, I think it's really important to engage them with the principles of research governance from the outset. So it, it's not just an issue for senior staff. So it's, in my view, it's never too early to learn about research governance, to think about strategic oversight of the project, where and how was data collected, who collected it, um, as the funding sponsor being re reported and recognized. So you can deal with questions about bias or vested interest, as ethical approval, been um, obtained from a recognized organization, noting some of the issues that Fiona mentioned about certain types of data. Um, research conduct is very important. You need to capture and fully and accurately report uh, your data. Uh, you don't um, add or omit information. So if you use robust governance approaches, that really gives credibility and confidence to the findings so that people will recognize you as a researcher who um, is one who works with integrity and reliability. And that will also, I think, enhance uh, your recognition and standing in the community. I think we all recognize today that there is pressure to work quickly, but it's really important with large data sets that you also work with care. And so when you're uh, analyzing your data, uh, you can use uh, well-established uh, methods and built-in tests. Uh, when you're thinking about hypothesis testing, it's got to be robust and comprehensive and cover the whole data set. You don't just want to select data which works for your findings. Um, if you collect large data sets, then you obviously believe that all the data has value. So you should consider how you can use all the data in the analysis. Um, it's also important to think about which data you might consider to be less reliable if there is problems with the data collection or perhaps uh, issues with noise on the data or uh, other aspects that might suggest that data is less reliable. That's also something you can fold into your data analysis. <clears throat> It's really important when you're analyzing data that you think about whether you're doing a sort of an empirical model that might be used to describe data and or findings based on observation, or whether you're going to develop um, a theoretical framework. So a robust theoretical framework should start from no assumptions. You build it up and develop it from first principles. The theory should be consistent upon current scientific understanding and current scientific theory. Uh, and a good theory will be able to extend what your data tells you and predict something that is not yet known or not yet discovered. So those differences are quite important um, and have uh, different um, values when analyzing your data. Unexpected findings can be very welcome because that might suggest you find something new and unexpected, but they can also mean that you might have an issue or a problem with your data, with your error, with your analysis, with your data collection. So you need to have um, ways of going back and checking um, unexpected findings in a way that can um, either validate them or demonstrate where uh, the issue lies. There are a number of well-known papers in the scientific community where people, I think, jumped too quickly and published what turned out to be uh, uh, erroneous data, which led to some interesting uh, discussions in journals. So really from the point of view of training and research methods, for me, I think you start um, at the beginning so there are some really well recognized and established ways of testing data, chi-square test residuals and so on, which are very powerful and useful measures of fit. I think you should expect researchers to be able to use those and understand those. 
before they might move on to newer, more sophisticated methods of data analysis and, and understanding. There might be times when you need to prepare your data for analysis, either by filtering it or cleaning it up. Uh, so it's important to understand when that should be used, why you should use it, what the impacts of that processing are before the analysis. Um, and just to stress really the point that I think Fiona made as well about a hypothesis, you know, really you are testing the hypothesis against your data. You are not testing your data against the hypothesis. So you need to be confident that what you're doing with your data analysis is correct in terms of your research methods and potential findings. It's also worth saying that you know, when you're thinking about collecting data, a good experimental design will yield good data. So think about the strengths and weaknesses in your experimental method, the equipment you're using, the parameters you're collecting. Um, any data will have some sort of intrinsic uncertainty associated with it, which will lead to errors that will propagate through as you do your data analysis. So you need to know what those are um, and what the implications are for confidence limits on your final analysis um, and data. And then finally, just to say that complex software can be a very powerful tool, but I think it's really important that you understand how it works, that you're confident in using it, that it's not just uh, a black box. Um, you should be able to explain in simple terms what algorithms are, why they're being used and what uh, they're able to do. So if you put all of that together, I think, you know, big data offers challenges, yes, but it also offers enormous opportunities. So I think effective training in preparing, managing, processing, analyzing, and then finally developing new theories based on big data is a really exciting opportunity for new researchers going forward. So I think at that point, I will say that's all I have to say. Thank you.